Arthur Oswald sat back in his chair. There was an awkward silence among the five men for a moment, and Arthur took a puff from his cigar as he mulled over what Dr. Blackstone had said. He almost lost himself in his thoughts and began chewing on his cigar as he stared off into the distance. It took Mayor Rockford kicking him in the shin to bring Arthur back to reality. He glared at the mayor. Ow! He said angrily. Now what did you do that for? Just making sure you're still awake, the mayor said with a wry smile. I appreciate it, Arthur said. I'll remember that when it's time to donate to your campaign. The color drained out of Mayor Rockford's face and Arthur chuckled. We were wondering what you thought about Mr. Blackstone's story, Mr. Radisson said. It's ridiculous, Arthur said. It sounds like something a college freshman wrote in the last five minutes before his paper was due. I wouldn't publish a story like that if you paid me to do it. Aha! He doesn't believe in ghosts either, Tom said, feeling vindicated. Arthur looked down at his drink and shook his cigar at Tom. Hang on, kid. I never said that. But you said his story was ridiculous, Tom said. Come on, Mr. Oswald. I could write a better ghost story right now, on the spot. I'm not arguing that, Arthur said, chewing the end of his cigar thoughtfully. I think Dr. Blackstone here is blowing smoke. I wouldn't believe a story like that in a million years. Exactly, Tom said in frustration, because ghosts aren't real. See, that's the thing, kid, Arthur said, giving Tom a sympathetic look. James story is fake, no doubt. I've seen plastic surgery jobs that were more honest than that campfire story. But just because James is full of it doesn't mean ghosts are fake. Tom threw his hands up in frustration and sat back in his chair. You people are unbelievable. Ghosts aren't real. I used to think that too, kid, Arthur said. That was back 20 years and 100 pounds ago. I used to think just like you back in my youth, when I was all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Unlike James over here, I've seen real ghosts. Now I've seen spooks that will make your head spin. This is stupid, Tom said. You didn't see a ghost. Sure I did, Arthur said defensively. And not just any ghost, but the ghost of my poor Aunt Peggy. She scared my wife half to death, I'll tell you that. It all happened right after her funeral. My sister Annie and I loved our Aunt Peggy, and she loved us too. Unfortunately, she also loved food, something that runs in the family. After she lost her husband in a car crash, she began to eat more and more. Well, poor Aunt Peggy, she ate her way into an early grave. She was maybe about the age I am now, come to think of it. Maybe that should be a wake-up call. Still, if you think I'm fat, you should have seen her. When she sang, every circus in town let out early. I remember a few years ago thinking I was exaggerating just how big she was, and I found an old photo of her. We had to go with an 11 by 17 just to fit her in the picture. She was huge, and as big as she was, she left an even bigger hole in our hearts when she died. The doctors said she died of heart problems. I guess in a way they were right, but it wasn't the high blood pressure that killed her. Poor old Aunt Peggy died of a broken heart. That's what really got her, and it took four years to do it. We had to cremate her. They just didn't make coffins in her size. She barely fit in the crematorium. None of us wanted to do it. She had always wanted to be buried on her side in her nightgown. That way we could all pretend she was asleep. We did the best we could, but when your nightgown doubles as a bed sheet, it makes things hard. It was a real tragedy, too. She was never really skinny, but back before her husband died, she was a beautiful woman. She was the perfect housewife, and she was basically a second mother to me and my sister. She needed some of us to say something after the first 50 pounds, but we all thought it was rude. After about 100 pounds, we all got together and talked to her about her weight. We told her it wasn't healthy, and that she needed to stop. But she insisted there wasn't a problem. Worse than that, she had people around her that encouraged her unhealthy diet. Can you believe that? Close friends, doctors, even her own family. Looking back, that hurt the most. I don't see how you can say you love someone while helping to dig their grave. And all of them did just that, one spoon at a time. So, when the old woman croaked, it didn't come as a surprise to anyone. If anything, it was almost a relief. I know how bad that sounds, but it was like watching her slowly die right in front of us. So we cremated her, and we had her funeral. It was a nice outdoor service, with perfect May weather. The flowers were blooming, the birds were singing, and it was warm and sunny outside. It was like God was smiling down on her one last time. The pastor did a good job consoling the family. My mother and sister cried their eyes out. All in all, I couldn't have asked for a better send-off for old damn Peggy. I was still broken up, of course. And I know it about killed my wife to see me in pain, but we managed. I didn't even feel sad until the first few days after the funeral. It didn't quite feel real then. It still felt like one strange dream. I barely remember the first couple of days after the funeral. I don't know how long it would have gone on like that, though, because three days after she died, I saw her ghost. I guess three is the magic number. Just like Jesus, old Aunt Peggy came back. 
My wife saw her first. I was at work when she called me about it. It was the most scared I had ever seen, my Janet. She was shivering so bad that my phone started shaking, if you can believe it. She started going on and on about Aunt Peggy and ghosts, and I didn't know what to make of it. I could barely understand what she was saying, to tell you the truth. I managed to calm her down before I hung up the phone, but when I got home from work, she was even more crazy. I thought Janet was joking at first. I can't say I thought it was all that funny, and I let her have a piece of my mind. But she seemed sure that Aunt Peggy had been in the living room with her while she was reading. I didn't believe her. Who would have? You wouldn't have believed her, I can tell you that. She managed to wear me down, though, and I told her I would stay the night in the living room to prove to her that there were no ghosts. I'm not a man that makes mistakes, or at least none that I'll admit, but that was a mistake for sure. She went into a panic and began begging me not to stay in the living room. At one point, she was so out of sorts, she even demanded that we sell our house and move. Ghost or not, I was not about to sell the house. I told her that there were no ghosts and that I would stay in the living room to prove it, and that was that. Well, she went so white I thought she might have become a ghost herself. But I put my foot down. Janet was scared, but she didn't say anything after that. After Janet made dinner, she left for our bedroom and I sat down in my easy chair. It was still early and I lit a cigar and poured myself a drink. I was just starting to relax with my newspaper when the lights flickered. I thought Janet was playing a prank on me. I rolled my eyes and kept reading. The lights kept flickering though, and I shouted down the hall at Janet and told her to leave the lights alone. She said she hadn't touched the lights, though, and I couldn't prove it was her, so I did the next best thing. I turned off the lights and made a fire. After making a note to call the electrician, I pulled the chair close to the fireplace and kept reading. I swear I hadn't been there for more than five minutes when the wind blew open the window and put out the fire. I was more than a little mad, and I threw the paper on the floor. After I closed and locked the window, I tried relighting the fire, but it was too dark to see, and I gave up. I went to bed early and tucked myself in with one of Janet's quilts. I was ready to fall asleep on the couch when all of a sudden the ashes in the fireplace began swirling around the room. I couldn't believe my eyes, and I watched the ashes turn into a person. It turned and looked at me, and I got a good look at its face. Imagine my surprise when good old Aunt Peggy was staring back at me from beyond the grave. She looked like she had rolled around in my ashtray, but there was no doubt it was her. She had a kind of frantic look, and she kept looking out of the corner of her eyes like she was scared of something, but beyond that she looked fine. If anything, she looked better than she had when she was alive. She must have lost a couple hundred pounds. She had never exactly been a skinny woman, and she still wasn't. Still, compared to how big she was when she died, she might as well have been downright anorexic. I was scared out of my mind, and I sat shivering under my quilt trying to hide from her. But it was no good. She turned to me and pointed. I thought she wanted me. I curled up in a ball and screamed, but she just pointed at me and left as soon as she had come. I didn't wait for her to come back. I ran up to our bedroom and locked the door behind me. I didn't sleep a wink that night. And I made sure to apologize to Janet several times in the morning. Well, I'll tell you what. I was all out of sorts that morning. I could hardly believe my own eyes. But sure as day, there was a pile of ashes in the living room. I wanted to help Janet calm down, but I was scared to death myself. I even thought about selling the house, like she said. I had no idea what to do. I didn't know if I was supposed to call a priest or an exterminator. Thankfully, Janet had an idea. She said that Peggy had manifested out of the ashes, and it might have something to do with her urn. I didn't have a better idea, so I called my dad and asked if Theron was still there. He wasn't too happy. He thought I was pulling his leg, but he checked the urn. Imagine our surprise when it was empty. My dad asked me if I knew what happened, and I told him I didn't have a clue. I couldn't tell him I had been haunted. I barely believed it myself, and I didn't want my dad thinking I had gone off my rocker. I told him I would look into it and get back to him, and hung up the phone. It wasn't until lunchtime that I figured it out. I always think better with a little food in my stomach. I remembered Aunt Peggy saying that she wanted to be buried in her nightgown next to Uncle Richard. The problem was, she hadn't been buried at all. As far as I knew, her urn was still in my dad's house, and I was pretty sure her ashes were on my floor. I figured that was why she was haunting us. First thing after lunch, I got in touch with the funeral director, and he got in touch with the grave diggers. They thought that what I was asking was a little odd, but they said they could dig up the grave in three days. I was afraid Aunt Peggy would haunt us for the next three days, too, but thankfully, she left us alone. I still felt scared silly the whole time, afraid she might come back at any moment. I still felt scared silly the whole time, though, afraid she might come back at any moment. Well, three days later, I gave my dad a call, and he showed up at Uncle Richard's gravesite with Aunt Peggy's empty urn. My wife Jenna had brought one of her old nightgowns, and we watched as the gravediggers lifted the casket out of the ground. My dad was madder than a horn, but I told him to wait until we had dug him up. I think he might have skinned me alive, but he changed his tune when the gravediggers opened up Uncle Rick's coffin. 
Even after all the strange things I had seen, I still couldn't believe what I saw. My dad almost passed out from the shock, and Janet screamed loud enough to make me cover my ears. The gravediggers couldn't make heads or tail of it either. They had never seen anything like it in their lives. Inside the coffin was Uncle Rick, and next to him was Aunt Peggy, laying on her side with one of her old nightgowns. She was made out of ashes, like she had been the night which she came to visit me. Still, there was no doubting it was her. Not knowing what else to do, I had Janet put the dress in the coffin, and I took the urn from my dad and put it in there too. He was too shocked to say much of anything about it. I had barely let go of the urn, when all of a sudden Uncle Rick turned to ashes too. There was a strong wind from behind me, and it blew them both away. We didn't know what to do. We just lowered the coffin back into the ground and walked away. I never saw Aunt Peggy after that. I guess the old lady was finally happy. It was fine with me. I loved her to death. But apparently that's where I draw the line.